Okay, so I posted an episode recently where my dog Inertia almost did not come back to me when I called her in an uncontrolled off-leash setting. And this led many viewers to ask me, Zach, what would you have done had she not come back to you? I thought it was a good question and one that I wanted to address outside of just a YouTube comment. I want to give you my perspective on this as well as giving you some additional tips that might improve your dog's recall. Come! Good girl! We were giving the dogs another round of exercise and I threw the ball pretty far and noticed that inertia was pretty much dead center between me and her mom. And she started to look at mom and Veronica as if to say, I think I'll go over there with them. But that would be a conflict because we've worked very hard at a developed game of fetch where there are structured rules. I want to know that she's going to be reliable and not distracted, even if by her own family. Slightly confusing situation there. I wouldn't want inertia in this uncontrolled environment like this to go running after them, even though that's her mom. Let's try that again, just to make sure that inertia understands coming to me is what I want, even when her mom's way down there. Okay. So you can see Bree in the cup. She gives her a look, so I do need to remind her. <laughs> so it's a little, I'd like to improve that. Throw it again. Come. She's giving her a look every time. Go. All right, so does she look at her mom? She gave her a glance, but came right back, so. I think that'll go a long way. This isn't something that's taught overnight, obviously, but having a strong foundation using positive reinforcement training and such a solid foundation in basic obedience and training is really what has helped me build confidence that my dog is extremely likely to come back to me when off leash. In a nutshell, my protocol for teaching dogs how to listen off leash are to seek out fenced environments and use a long lead in order to build this kind of reliability. This history has informed my decision to have my dog off leash in this setting. It's worth mentioning that by focusing on having that deep connection and that mutual trust with my dog that I haven't felt the need to rely on superficial collars like electric collars. To make sure that my dogs are ready for the real world, I continually introduce both artificial distractions and natural distractions that I know are going to be there, as well as snapping into training mode when an unforeseen distraction happens. Inertia has just spotted another dog. Stay. So I'm seeing a great opportunity to practice getting her more focused while in the presence of other dogs over here. Looks like I've got her attention. Hey, you want to play frisbee? Come around. Ready? Go. So I was able to get her attention off the dog onto me to play frisbee. That's always good. Let's see if this continues. I'm going to deliberately play at close range to these other dogs. She hasn't forgotten about the dog. You know, she's still keeping track. Stay. Come around. Yes, go. It's one of the reasons I like activities like fetch and frisbee. It gives them that outlet of running and chasing and jumping and biting, all that kind of fun stuff they like to do. And again, another great opportunity to practice come. So inertia in particular has gained a ton of experience of listening to me while in a distracted mindset. Some of the distractions I set up, some of them I'm able to kind of control that happen in the real world and others just happen and I have to snap into training mode to make sure that she listens to me. And inertia is used to all of those types of training methods, which are what I'm falling back on if she doesn't listen to me. Another possible strategy would be to ask inertia to stay at a distance. So maybe she's distracted by something and since we have practiced so much, stay at a distance while she evaluates a distraction because we're not just jumping into this cold. So it acts as a bit of a compromise, like come, she's not coming. So I can at least say stay. And I know that that communication is pretty strong and likely to be somewhat effective as well. So strengthening your dog's stay with distance, duration, and distractions in various environments in order to proof that skill is also really important. You can see how working on things like this five minutes at a time, five seconds at a time can be very effective. And that cumulative experience is what makes it extremely likely that my dog is going to come to me when I call her. As much as I don't advise the use of an electric collar, it's worth mentioning that if you're relying on that to make sure that your dog doesn't get away from you or for use in an emergency situation, you probably shouldn't have them off leash in the first place. I think that provides a false sense of security, knowing that the collars can malfunction 
or a dog can simply ignore the collar. Not to mention that you have to go through the process of shocking a dog to get them used to the collar in the first place, which is something that I choose not to do with my dogs. Also, during fetch training, the context that we were watching here, my dog is becoming naturally fatigued, and that makes her a lot easier to approach and to manage in off-leash situations because that energy level is usually significantly depleted. So in my estimation, the probability of her not listening to me at the beginning of a fetch training session is extremely low because her motivation is extremely high to play the game of frisbee or ball or whatever. After several throws, if she were to become distracted, her energy is usually significantly depleted so that a light jog I could easily get to her. And she's not the kind of dog that's likely to bolt on me. And I think the reason for that is that we put in the work and built our communication so that she knows how to listen to me with simple requests like, come. So if she didn't come back to me, I at first would shorten the distance and try and get her to chase me, getting her attention back on me. If that wasn't successful, I'd go up to her and secure her on a leash. And for the next several weeks, at least in environments comparable to this, I would put that long lead back on, I would take a step back and further prepare my dog for scenarios like this. If my dog's not listening to me, it's not their fault, it's my fault because I haven't taught them yet. So it's really important to own that. We don't wanna blame our dogs for not listening to us. Being overwhelmingly consistent when your dog does come to you and reinforcing that with something they enjoy, whether it's a treat, whether it's a quick play session or something else that your dog just loves is so vital. That reinforcement history can be so powerful. So reach deep to acknowledge and reward your dog as much as reasonably possible when they come to you. I mean, to this day, we have treats throughout our house. It's nothing to give my dog a tiny piece of a treat when she comes to me. Every reinforcement, your recall is likely to become that much stronger. Reinforcement efficacy like this is as true as math. Making sure our dogs are well nourished is also very important. Thank you to our sponsor, Nom Nom, who makes amazing fresh food straight to your door, pre-portioned, ready to go, so that your dog gets the benefits of a high quality diet in the way only fresh food can offer. You guys can get half off a two week trial. I'll have information in the description below. Click thumbs up, subscribe, follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and everywhere else that we are.